to imagine this, and he wrote, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel when I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence or to my knees? Will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes, when I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when, when all I would is forever worship you. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or will I, or will I be able to sing at all? Another songwriter says, this is my temporary home. It's not where I belong. Windows in rooms that I am passing through, this is just a stop on the way to where I'm going. I'm not afraid because I know this is my temporary home. He doesn't have to imagine anymore. <laughs> For the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If he were to say something to you today, he would say, I know, I understand, but I'm not coming back over here. It's so much better than where, over, over there is so much better than where you are down here. Because the Bible says when we gather, finally gather in the presence of Jesus, there will be no more tears and no more death. All of those things will be passed away. We will be forever in the presence of Jesus. Therefore, family, Comfort one another. Comfort one another with these words. May God bless you. Thank you. And say amen for the pastor. Amen. Well, this is what I want uh, you to do for me now because... Uh, Pastor Steve is going to do the eulogy, and I want us to begin to pray for him. Amen. I have known this family for a long time. One of the images where their parent, they're on the picture with their mom and dad. Um, years ago, I was working for a place called the Keyboard Place. They were just getting the church open, and they were looking to get an organ and all that. So long, they were all little children that they were young, younger. They younger than I am, but they were little small children at the time and this is a wonderful family now did y'all hear what i said this is a wonderful loving family and they are tight-knit group the sisters are going to come at this time and they are going to bless us with music joy is coming all the girls they coming and they're going to bless us with music and as soon as they finish pastor steve is going to come with uh the eulogy uh, for this afternoon. Can somebody in the house shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Oh, we can do better than that. Praise the Lord. Oh, come on. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our God is so faithful. You all have been so amazing to us over the last week. Um, when all of this started and you all have just shown your love, words cannot begin to express our appreciation. Even those who were here last night and, and some who could make it today who had words last night to share. I can't even begin to call names because you all have all been so amazing. Thank you so much for even those who are singing and, and on the instruments. They all had relationships with Kevin. So we appreciate you all pushing through and yet being here with us on today. Praise God for that. All the things you all have said are also true. Um, Kevin wasn't just like that, you know, when he was out in front of people. He was like that at home. And we will greatly, yes. greatly miss him. Um, our, our father gave Kevin a charge, and Kevin would always remind us when we'd get like, Kevin, you, you know, you all been our business. That, that, that same breath, Teresa, you were talking about, we experienced it all the time. Not exaggerating, we'd go on a date, y'all, and Kevin would be in the car, think he had, following us as we go on dates. 
not sometimes, but all the times. And he did it to so many of you. Many of my friends have just named, man, I, I was out there calling, saying, man, I was out, and I looked around the corner, Kevin over there hiding, trying to see who I'm with. <laughs> he did it all the time to so many of us, but that, that was just his love. And so our father gave him a charge to take care of us, and he did it so, so, so well. So you all continue to pray with us. Um, at the end of the day, y'all, we still say to God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Kevin loved to hear uh, our brother Stephen uh, preach. He loved to hear our brother Corey play. But I think the thing he loved the most was to hear his sister sing. So we're going to attempt, y'all. And we don't even know how good we sound, for real. We don't even know. But he called himself, he called him, uh, he said he was our business manager and we would go places. We're not, we're not even a real group, by the way, y'all. We're not even a real group. <laughs> but he'd have us with cards made. We're like, Kim, what you doing? We're not even a real group. <laughs> and, 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 and we'd do a concert and he'd introduce us and he'd call us, what'd he call us? The Three Amigos sometimes and he'd call us. I mean, he'd just say crazy things. But he was always behind us, every last one of us. When we went off to college, Kevin was the one there taking us. The kids, every kid that's going to college in our family, he was right there and as someone said I always slide your money I always give you I could go on and on and on but at the end of the day y'all we know even in this our God is worthy of the praise yes. this is Kevin's number one favorite song he'd call us on the phone wants to sing it to him on the phone so y'all pray with us as we attempt to do this selection
if you will just indulge me just for one uh, quick moment, I want to thank, first of all, the reverend clergy that are here today. Amen. Grateful for all of the preachers that are here, those that are in the congregation, in the balcony, and those that are seated here. Uh, we thank God for each of you. But before we go any further, if you would just indulge me as a representative of the clergy, if you will allow for me to ask, not slighting anyone that's here, but if you will allow for us to just recognize and have words for us, Bishop Brandon Porter, who is the Bishop of Tennessee Central uh, Jurisdiction and Church of God in Christ, amen. General board member, member of the Presidium, amen. And he's a friend and we love him. I'm gonna ask him if he'd come at this time, Bishop Porter. God bless each of you, and I certainly don't want to infringe on the time. I'm anxious to lend support and prayers as well, certainly to this family at large, to each of you. Uh, Kevin and Stephen both were endeared to me while they were in college in Jackson, Tennessee, and I was pastoring there as well. And what wonderful uh, delight it was to, to have that relationship. I've enjoyed the remarks. Whenever I go to a homegoing service, certainly it's a blessing to hear the remarks. You find out so much more about the expanded life of people from others. Amen. But family, just simply remember, nothing is lost when you know where it is. Amen. And I was just about ready to bring the Clark sisters, but I'm going to save $20,000 now. Amen. <laughs> God bless you all. Love you. Preach, Pastor Steve. I know God's going to add strength to you. My wife has an event going on. I may have to slip out, but no disrespect. I love this family, and I certainly love you, and thank you for supporting them as others of us are doing as well. Bless you, Bishop Stevens, as well. God bless you. Again, to each of you, thank you so much uh, for being here today. We are yet thanking God and... Uh, I uh, just want to say something very quickly about uh, Kevin, who, of course, is uh, our brother, uh, my middle brother between Corey and myself. I was blessed to have such a loyal and faithful good brother. I really was. And uh, Corey is almost doubly of that as well. Uh, they're just good brothers, and I'm so thankful. I love them so much. Uh, Kevin uh, was really a special person and uh, it showed throughout his life and I'm just so grateful uh, to have been able to call him my brother. He took care of me uh, when I was down, when I was out, Kevin was there. Uh, I could go on and as Greg said earlier and others have said, I can just go on and on uh, about my brother. I want to thank God for my sisters who so um, just given a Herculean effort uh, this week in shouldering much of what you see, much of what the organization and everything that you see. Amen. Uh, amen. And missing him, I said it almost at least twice this week. I, and we were together and I, I almost said, where's Kevin? Uh, just, we're just so used to being together and counting each other you know, and when we're with our friends and our brothers and, and uh, we, we always are asking about one another. And I almost said a couple of times this week, where is Kevin? And uh, I'm just grateful and I'm thankful for his friendship and his brotherhood that he gave to me. And I'm grateful that my family acquiesced and allowed for me to have the final words over my brother. Um, I wouldn't have had it any other way uh, as difficult as this is, as Kendrick said earlier, as difficult as this is, uh, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I, I knew it was going to be either me or Corey. Thank you, Bishop Rogers. I didn't see you in the, in the congregation. God bless you, Bishop Rogers. Amen. Bishop Charles Franklin Rogers with us. It's going to be either be me or Corey, uh, without a doubt. And Corey has an indomitable strength uh, that is quiet, but he's a strong brother. Uh, and I thank God for him and all of you uh, today. And I don't mean to overlook anyone, but um, it's time for us now to go to the Lord and to hear what the Lord has to say on 
the matter. Um, I want to tell you from the get-go that this will not be an exegetical sermon uh, or an expository sermon in the classic sense. So all the preachers and professors that are here, please forgive me uh, for that. Um, and I'm not taking a text per se. I'm not extracting the truth from the text. I'm not looking at interpretation or uh, application or any of that at this time. But I'm, I just want to preach what the Lord has, I believe, given me. Uh, this won't be a pithy message uh, full of platitudes and cliches and uh, just well-worn, threadbare cliches that we've heard over and over again, these trite remarks uh, that we often say there's nothing wrong with them if they're appropriate, uh, but um, the Lord has led me in a different way. Um, and I believe this being my brother who for many years was my best friend. He's, he always, let me say this, he always took my friends. When I got married, my best friends became his best friends. And uh, that's just the way Kevin was. And we, and, and we love him. We love him. Amen. We love him. Um, I would ask for you, if you would, uh, that you would give me these few minutes that are mine on today um, that you would indulge me this afternoon just for a few moments and give me an audience if you would and give me your rapt attention uh, I believe uh, and I say this only because I believe that uh, there is there is a message I believe that there is a word from the Lord that he has given me to preach in this time as I, as I queried God uh, this last few days, with all that was going on, I, I felt increasingly impressed in my spirit to preach on this solemn occasion from the subject, at death's door. At death's door. And as a means of introduction, Someone once said, death is the irreducible common denominator of life. Yes. I want to stand and give witness that if you don't know, uh, the hearse wheels roll down every street. Hearse wheels roll down every drive. Every avenue, every boulevard, every cove, and every cul-de-sac, hearse wheels will roll. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, death is the, the equal opportunity destroyer. Irrespective of race, irrespective of creed or color, gender, your station in society, your lot in life, Death is coming your way. Another philosopher is quoted as saying, death is the dilemma of the living in such a succinct and profound way that's so very true. It's those of us that are alive that have the difficulty. We're left to deal with the ravages of death. The dead have already crossed the eternal divide. The dead has, has already spanned the otherwise incrossable chasm. It is we who remain on this side that must wrestle with this perennial enemy. That's what the Bible calls death, the last enemy that has plagued mankind since the beginning of time. And even more specifically on this afternoon, on this day, death has vanquished our brother and our friend, Kevin. It is us, those of us who remain on this side, who must deal with the heartache, who must deal with the sorrow, who must 
deal with the grief and the pain in the wake of, again, the ravages of death. The horrors of death have terrified every civilization for six millennia. Mummification and the pyramids were means of attempting to demystify. It's a, it's a, it is an attempt to, uh, to blunt the glaring reality of the effects of the unrelenting outcomes of death. And that is what we have done for centuries, beloved, and this is not accusatory, but that is what we've done today, even right now. Since we cannot control death, neither can we mitigate death, the next best thing is to euphemize death. Hmm. A euphemism is a, it, it's, it's a substitute. It is a, it's an attempt to blunt that which is harsh, that which would otherwise be unpleasant. And we're doing that even today. This, this is not accusatory. This is what we do when we refer to death in euphemistic terminology and speech, such as when we say, he has passed on. She has gotten her wings. They have transitioned. And even sometimes we get both euphemistic and poetic at the same time. For we say God has picked his best rose out of his rose garden. And that's all euphemistic language. Having us to substitute the reality with something a little bit more smooth and a little bit more nice. Furthermore, we place our loved ones in placid and serene resting places, <laughs> like serenity gardens. Oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> Rolling Hills Cemetery, not graveyard, cemetery. Forest lawn resting place. Even this week, I was at Memorial Park getting the place for Kevin. And as I was out there, there were people in the graveyard, in the cemetery, taking pictures, <laughs> sitting up under the tree, reading a book. They were jogging along the trails. Yes, Memorial Park is picturesque. It's, 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 it's pastoral. It's, it's idyllic. It looks good. And it divorces us from the reality of death. We, we, we beautify, this is not accusatory. Can you say amen? amen? This is not accusatory, but we beautify the remains. We place remains in beautiful couch coffins. So as to remove ourselves from the Stark reality, first and foremost, that they are dead. Dead. Thank you, Brother Corey. You helping me preach in here. People walk by the beer and say, he look like he's sleeping to divorce ourselves from the reality that he is dead. We don't hear language like that even in places like this. And, 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 and that the in reality that there remains, 
please forgive me, family. Thank you for the latitude. Their remains would decay, would rot, would become putrefied if left to themselves. And very few, very few people have seen death unmasked like that in this day and time without the aid of the preserving sciences of the mortician. Very few people have seen death like that in its full reality. But, but let my, I must say that I have, I, I have, I have. I've seen a body in rapid decomposition. I've seen it when they found it in the Memphis sweltering heat in the summer, only but 36 hours unattended. You'd be surprised what death looks like. The bloating, that the skin is loosened and it is puckered and it breaks because of the tissues and the muscles swell. I've seen it. I've seen the bloating and I've seen the bloating caused by the accumulating, uh, the accumulating gases that are in the body, the sulfide and, and, and the ammonia and the methane. And when you walk up on a body like that, there is an extreme malodorous stench that you'll never forget. This is death unmasked. That we see, I was there and I saw the flies and the maggots that went in the nose and in the mouth, in the ears and in the eyes. Maggots coming out of the face, maggots coming out of the ears. Oh my goodness. We've seldom, if ever, in this day and time, there was a time when people knew what death looked like. But in this day and time, we don't know what death looks like. We think this is death. This is not death. This is euphemistic. Thank God for it. Because we wouldn't be able to stand it if it were otherwise. And all of the ugliness and all of the stinkiness of death is removed and lost on us. Mm, brother and sister, death is ugly. Death is stinky. That is the very reason the Bible calls it the last enemy. Death is not our friend. Death is horrifying. It's terrifying. And all of the needed emotion and understanding and the gripping of reality of that is lost on most of us. It's lost on us. And with all of that putrid smell, with all of that disfigurement of the body, with all of the invasion of the flies and the maggots that invade the body, with all of their, this ugliness that death brings on, all of the horror of physical death, brother and sister, yeah. 